Um, yeah. What we want to do is talk about visual analytics within um, a virtual world space. So. Laptop side to actually do it. So what we're going to do is, is break. We've got two sessions: one after coffee, and then second one after coffee. Um, what we want to do is cover probably three things. First of all, I want to do a PowerPoint piece, giving you the background to what it is we've been doing in virtual worlds in terms of, of uh, data visualization. Um, I'm then going to give you a fairly short uh, demonstration of Datascape. And what we've then got is four worked examples uh, that we can then work through during the rest of the, of the sessions. We may not get through all four, we'll just see how things go. Um, we've got worksheets, or there should be worksheets, hopefully in your binders. If not, we've got them available on the, the computers. Um, and I will, well, and Daryl will actually lead you through step by step through those worked examples so you can see what to do. If you feel you want to raise your head and just play with it, then by all means go on and do so. So that's the general shape of what we're going to do. Um, so, who are we? Um, Dayton is something that uh, focuses on using immersive worlds and immersive spaces. Primarily over the last uh, what, eight years or so, our focus has been, has been around using them for training and simulation. But one of the things that we kept bumping into was their potential for the use uh, within data visualization. Uh, I set data up in 2004. My own background for the 10 years prior to that, um, I was working for 7 Trent PLC in the utility industry uh, in IT. For 10 years before that, I was an officer in Royal Signals. Uh, my last two years in Royal Signals was spent in signals intelligence and counterterrorism. So I've got some sort of feeling for, for some of the domain space, albeit quite a long time ago. Um, and as you see, we pick up various awards. I'll mention some of that uh, as we go through. Um, the step change for us probably came about a year ago uh, when, because of some of the work we've been doing with MOD, uh, British Aerospace saw what we were doing, said that looks interesting, particularly the boys at Desco looked at it, um, and effectively they made a corporate investment in the company last summer uh, to say, actually, can we build a product around this, around this idea of immersive visual analytics? And that's what the team has been doing over the last year, and we're hoping to launch that product at the end of this month. So what you're going to see today, very much a beta copy, it has still got bugs in it, it's not actually released formally yet, uh, but it should give you a good idea of what the application can do. Uh, we're based at Birmingham Science Park, which is just behind Aston University, for those of you who know Aston, and we've actually got quite close links with all of the regional universities. We've done joint uh, MOD funded projects with Aston University, also with Coventry University, we've done TSB funded projects with the University of Birmingham. So we're quite well connected into the, uh, the local universities there. Some idea of the range of the sorts of companies we've worked for. As I say, the vast majority of those have been around training simulations. Um, quite a preponderance of universities. We reckon we've worked now for two dozen universities uh, in the UK and abroad, uh, both in, in North America, also in the Middle East. A lot of those simulations have actually been medical. Uh, not as in surgery, but in more procedural. Um, so things like uh, nurse training. We did a project recently at the University of Hospital Birmingham on training nurses to deal with bereavement and what happens when somebody dies on the board. Uh, we've got another project currently running with the University of West England on psychology training. Um, and we just, in the process of signing a contract with Open University uh, for doing field geology and doing virtual field trips. So that's uh, where the vast majority of our activities come from in the last few years. What we do as a company uh, broadly breaks down in, into three areas if we try to change and reduce the numbers but new things keep popping up. Data visualization, uh, we'll talk about a lot more about. Uh, so learning and training, uh, the screenshot there is from a, a project we did a couple of years ago for the city of New York uh, for training their emergency managers how to deal with a hurricane and how to take a school in New York and turn it into a refugee centre. And that was about a five to six hour simulation uh, that they could run. The interesting thing about that project is we have never met the client. We have never even spoken to them on Skype. All of the project management, everything took place inside the Immersive World platform, uh, which is a nice way of doing things. Um, and we're finding, particularly obviously with things like BAE's involvement, there's a lot of interest in how we can take these environments that we're creating for training and actually then augment those with security information. So actually into these environments, we can bring in CCTV feeds, we can bring in ANPR data, we can bring in door swipe information, so we can actually augment uh, the physical model with all the security information. And if you're then actually trying to manage an incident or plan for an incident, having that information inside that digital model and being able to th move through that digital model at the same rate as one of the guys on the ground, in fact, you can use GPS so to show you where the clip on the ground is, you can put wider CCTV into his helmet, 
uh, so you can see what he sees, but you get the sense of where he is far better because you're in the 3D model as he's moving through it. And we've been doing some work with VA in that area. But today is very much about data visualization. So what I want to do is, is sort of give you a, an idea of the journey that we've been through um, in going from what we first started doing back in around sort of 2005, 2006, looking at, at using immersive worlds uh, for data visualization um, up to the present day. And this is, is a good place to start because you know, one of the first things that people do when they are given a virtual world or an immersive space is they start rebuilding the real world because that's what they're comfortable with. And so what we found was us and other people started building things like this as a virtual control room. So this is something we did for the US. Uh, the US government runs something called the Federal Virtual Worlds Challenge. Um, and it looks at, basically, it's a challenge to say, how can we use virtual worlds to solve this, this, this problem or that problem? Um, and this one was around data visualization. Uh, so what we did is we built a virtual control room. Um, so I've got the map I'm stood on is Google Maps. So that is live, so I can zoom that into any place in the globe. I could have up to 20 or 30 people in that space at the same time, all coming in remotely. Uh, we've got RSS feeds coming in on the screens around the edge. We can click those to read the news stories. Uh, and we've plotted pins on the map so we can actually see where the various stories are. And what's interesting is when you get a space like that, if you start see, uh, seeing, say, if they get a coincidence of pins in one particular location, you walk your avatar over to it, one of your colleagues walks over to it, you get the brain gets a lot of spatial cues about what it is you're discussing and where you're discussing it and who stood with you which makes it a lot easier to remember that conversation you know, days, weeks, or even years later because you've got the same sort of cues available to you as you would have uh, if you were actually doing that in the real world. You know, if you compare that to, say, a typical Skype conference or a video conference where it's always the same room, doesn't matter what the conversation is, it's always the same set of screens, you don't get that same sense of actual being in the same meeting in the same place. Whereas what you find is in a virtual space like this, you do get that sense of, yes, we we're all there together um, and we remember it because of that. So say, the, first, the first instinct, if you like, is to say, well, let's build something that looks like a real world control room so we can visualize our data in possibly the same way as we would do um, in a physical world. The, um, the worksheets meant to be in your pack, but I understand they're not. Um, so they're on the web. So if you want to, take, to download a copy of the worksheet, just fire up the browser. Um, that's one we're going to be starting with. Um, so that's all one URL. So datascape space exercise space hyphen space farm or space v2.pdf. So if you want to download a copy of the, the, uh, the worksheet, do that. And that's the one we'll be using initially. And I'll have a copy on the screen as well. But we just have to switch back and forth between the application and the... Uh... Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. The doing is I'll, I'll be basically stepping through that worksheet um, on the screen. Um, as I say, if you want to raise a head or do other things um, and just explore the two by means, do so. Uh, but otherwise, that's that one, and then we'll probably do one of the other ones. We'll give you a good idea of some of the functionality and let you try it out. Uh, Daryl's going to be my glamorous assistant, so he'll wander around. So uh, if you need help with anything, then uh, he's going to speak to him, and then we'll, we'll reverse roles, and we'll take it from there. Um, okay, so to get started, if you just want to uh, launch the, the Datascape icon, it uh, should be on your desktop, and that should bring you up to the Select Workspace screen, and then, yeah, you need to click on Play, and it gives you the option to say Play. Well, the, lo the lovely thing about building on Unity is it thinks it's a game. Okay, and then from the workspaces there, if you want to choose the one that says Farm, Farnborough and click on the Farnborough workspace. Farnborough. We're all, we're all working off the same database server here, so that might be why there's a bit of a lag trying to load stuff up. <laughs> so 
So it'll be interesting when we come to plot phase points. Okay, so what we've got is um, the scene, and on the scene we've got a map. That thing that we call that a panel. Now that panel, as you'll see, we can put various uh, different things on it. To move around the space, you've got two modes in Datascape. You've got edit mode and view mode. So initially we're in edit mode, so we've got the panel on the left-hand side, of the window on the left-hand side. Um, if we want to move into view mode, just hit the space bar and all the panels should disappear. And then once we're in view mode, we can move through the environment. Uh, we use the mouse to change where we're looking. And then we use the cursor keys to actually move through the environment. If you want to move in a different direction, just point your mouse in a different direction. If you want to move up and down, use page up and page down on the keyboard. So that will move you up and that will move you down. If you're a gamer, uh, you can use the WSAD keys as well to do your movement. So whichever you're comfortable with. But that's essentially all to navigate around the space. That's what we need to do. Okay, if you want to sort of move yourself to a position where you can sort of see a fair chunk of the map, and probably ideally have it so that the, uh, the vertical axis, the, the y-axis bar is on the left-hand side, so we're actually facing north against the map. Okay, then press the space bar, and that'll bring up the edit screen. If you go to the file tab, click on that, then at the bottom there, there's a settings icon, or settings button, click on that. Uh, and that's where you can adjust the sort of the movement speed. So if you're finding things are moving too fast for you as you move the mouse and move the cursor, uh, you can just change those settings so as to have something that behaves a little bit better for you. So as we move around, then uh, by all means, pop back to that so as to get the settings right for you. Okay, just close that. Says. That's a good start. I did say this was a development version. Right. If you've got it stuck on the screen, it might be worth just reopening the, 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 the uh, workspace. I still got it. Okay. And if it stays on the screen, it might be worth quitting out and coming back in again. It's just mine. I've got a mouse that's doing funny things, actually. And then, so press the space bar to go into edit mode, bring up the file menu. Uh, sorry, bring up the scene menu. Go to the scene menu. The scene menu is where we can control the background. Uh, so if you click on sky, we get a variety of different options for uh, the sky. So you can set that to whatever uh, you want to work with. Likewise for the ground, a variety of different options for that. So you can set that to something appropriate. Yeah. Obviously, it will very much depend on sort of what colours you bring in for, uh, for objects in due course as to which is uh, the most appropriate. But that's how we just change that to get it to, to be what we want to, uh, to look for. Okay, if we now... Okay, if you've got something suitable on that. If you now click on the panel, so just left-click on the panel where we've got the map, you'll notice the panel goes slightly yellow and it starts to wobble, just to let you know that that's what you've currently got selected. What you should also get is the panel options pane comes up here, which gives me the information about that particular panel. Um, what we can do here is things like if we want to change the size of the panel, um, then we can just make it smaller, bigger, to whatever size we want to, to, to use. The way we describe it is think of the, of the, uh, the panel um, as it being a bit like the size of the piece of paper you're going to work with. Um, because when we then come to do the ranges, then that's actually drawing the axes on the, on the sheet of paper. Um, nominally, it's just units. It doesn't mean anything, that thousand. 
Um, so it's just a thousand units. Uh, obviously, what it means in terms of the distance on the ground will depend on the axes that we set later on. So a thousand by a thousand is probably about right uh, for this particular exercise. Further down, uh, you'll notice it's got texture and preset. Um, click on it, but don't change anything. Um, but this is where we can then change what we want to actually put onto the panel. Um, so I've got uh, four options. I can set open street maps. I can bring open street map mapping into here. I can bring Google Maps into here. Uh, I can give it a web address for a particular uh, service or a particular image. Um, or I can choose a preset off a bunch of preset images. And you can add your own images to those. So if you've got particular pieces of mapping, you've got particular schematics, you've got overlays, you've got tribal maps, you can bring those in and bring those either onto the panel um, or as overlays for an existing panel. Um, but for now, just click back on preset because we're going to be using the, uh, the one for, uh, for Farmer as the mapping side of it. Okay, one other thing just to show you, but again, sort of don't touch when we uh, go through to it. If we go through to edit, click on edit ranges, this is where we now set the size of our X and Y and Z axes. So we've set the size of a piece of paper. This is where we're now saying, actually, in this case, my X range is these are the longitudes, uh, the Y range, those are the latitudes, and there's my labeling for them. What we can do with, if we're actually using Google Maps or we're using OpenStreetMap, we can actually just browse across the map, zoom in and zoom out, same as you can do with Google Maps, so as to get onto the right uh, piece of map that you want. But here, because we're actually using a texture, so we're going to go and fetch it dynamically off the web, uh, we've manually set what the ranges are for that particular uh, location. Okay, so close uh, that window down. And then, still with a panel selected, what you then want to do is click on Load Data onto Panel. So if you want to click on Load Data onto this panel, and what you should then get is the list of data sets. When we bring data into Datascape, we've got two choices. We either bring it in unattached to any objects, or else we can bring it in attached to an object, not such as a panel. The advantage of bringing it in attached to the panel is it means we've already set up the size of the axes and the position, so it can just sort of inherit that uh, directly. So what we want is the Farnborough Twitter data set. Um, so if you want to choose that, my guess is then going to pause whilst all the machines begin to get the data. So. What that then says is, okay, these are the mappings I've currently got set up. So we can create as many different mappings as we want to for the data um, and save those all. And we've got a, a default mapping set up here called All Tweets. So if you just want to click on that. And what we've now got is, as I showed you earlier on with the, the, the example from around here, we've got mapping of latitude and longitude to X and Z. We've got a timestamp. Uh, difference. This is historic data. This is actually was we captured all the tweets around Farnborough Air Show for the week of the air show. So that's what this data is. Um, so there's an offset there that basically is the beginning of the week. Um, so we're using that as our base of the map and then plotting the data in time above that and showing everything as spheres and cyan and so on. Okay, so once we've done that, we can click on continue and it should then plot the data and we probably wait whilst everything fetches the information. And what you should see is all the little science spheres popping in, showing all the data. And if you want to zoom back, zoom back a bit, what you'll notice if you look up into the sky is the stuff is heading off way up into the sky. Uh, because actually we've got a week's worth of data and the range we've got on our vertical bar, the vertical axis, um, is basically not big enough. So if you press the space bar and then go to scene and choose the vertical bar and then scroll down to where it says edit ranges And at the moment, we've got 700 as a range. It's actually 700 minutes. Um, it's worth putting up to about 7,000. And then that'll crunch all the data down so it all appears sort of nicely um, above the map. And then once you've done that, you can close off that window.
We can actually also, we've got the, also got the option to actually adjust the height with the mouse. We can actually dynamically slide that far bigger and smaller. Um, so we can actually change the amount of 3D that we have. So if you want to see all the data actually flattened, uh, we can do that, just bring it down to 2D, or we can just incrementally increase um, the amount of 3D that we have. Okay. If we want to actually read um, any of these tweets, then we need to make it active. So go back to the data tab, and you'll notice there we've got 20,000 uh, tweets here in the database. Click on active, and then press space bar. We can now fly through the data, and then if we want to read one of these, just press the space bar again, and hover over, and we can then see the tweets. We can see who it was tweeted by, what date and time was, latitude and longitude, um, and actually the content of the tweet as well. Can we see a thread of that through? We will see that in a moment. Yep, we'll see that in a moment. Okay, so is everybody happy everybody got to that, that point in terms of, of navigating around it? Okay. So, yeah, Dara, uh, looks like some of the back there has got a very tight set of ranges. Okay. Okay, press the space bar. Yeah, press the space bar and then you can do it. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. Yep. Okay, we now um, in edit mode, we just want to go to data again and then go to the data set. If we then click on the data set, we get the menu appears below us. And from that, we want to uh, choose remap. Then that takes us back to the mapping screen. So from here, if we then want to change the color of, of, of the objects, then we're just going to change all the, them all to uh, the same color. So if you just want to choose a color, we do sort of all the standard colors plus sort of light and dark versions of all the colors. So there's a fairly full color set there. So just change the color value. If you want to actually see uh, just a quick guide to some of the colors, if you click on the double arrows, then it gives you a selection of colors there. Make sure you clear that box before you choose any of them. Click on OK. And then once you've done that, just click on Reload. <coughs> and all your data points should change to a new color. If you want to change the size, then basically exactly the same, or the shape, just click on remap. If I want to change the size, make them all a little bit uh, smaller. If I want to change the shape to, say, cube. And again, with shapes, there's a drop down. So if you click on shape, you can see the in green there, the standard shapes. I wouldn't suggest using any of the ones in yellow at the moment for this number of data points. Just keep to the basic shapes. And again, reload. Just one, one point about sort of choice of shapes. Um, what we find is that cubes are actually a bad thing to use for this. Uh, the reason is, when you get a whole bunch of tweets running together, it can be quite hard to work out exactly how many tweets you've got there. So you can see here I've got a, a, a sort of elongated cube, which is a whole bunch of tweets, but because they're all stacked on top of one another, I can't tell how many tweets are there. That's one of the reasons why we use spheres. So if I change that to a sphere... ...and reload it... then you can actually see now that bunch of, of, of that long uh, set of cubes has actually resolved itself into about one, two, three, four, five different tweets. So spheres, anything that's curved is actually very useful so to be able to differentiate uh, between uh, different uh, continuous sets. Um, okay, so it's, I'm just conscious of time and I know that bit's not working. So what we'll do is... If you're following on the sheet, we'll probably jump through to number 23.
So what we're going to do now is, is, is try and follow somebody through. Um, so what I'm going to do is look at my data. Okay, if you, get, if you, can, uh, you can do this by search, but you can try and do it manually. But if you get yourself to a view like that, so we're looking over Farnborough, um, you'll notice we've got a cluster of activity here, um, and it's actually all from the same user. So this is all a guy called Remco. So we've got a whole bunch of tweets there. Uh, what's interesting is we've actually also got another bunch of tweets from him there. Um, so he might be somebody that we're interested in. Um, so if we want to actually do a search on the database uh, for that particular person, um, then there's two ways of doing it. Um, one is we can actually, if you've actually got him on your screen, then you can do it this way, which is you right-click on his, one of the tweets, choose Show All Values. It then shows me all the data that we've got for that particular data point from Twitter. And all I need to do is click on his username and tell it to find similar. And it pre-populates the query wizard for me. And I run that. and it finds 32 items. If you can't actually find him on the, on the plot, the other way of doing it is you just choose the data set, click on Query Wizard, and then actually if you change that to like, clear that, and Remco, that would do the same search. And what you should end up with is those 32 data points selected. Okay, people with happy with that, just following through. So that's consent. Right, I'm just going to do that again for myself. Okay, so once I've got my 32 points selected, what I then do is I want to tag this for further analysis. So I just choose the option there that's down that's for tag items. Click on that, and I've now got a new tag. What I can then do is click on that tag, and I can then give it a name. What I can also do, if I want to make these points uh, nice and obvious, if I want to, I can uh, change their shape, I can change their colour, so I'm going to override the colour. So these ones, in this case, are going to appear in red against my green ones. And if I want to, I can make them a bit bigger as well, so they're just that much more obvious on the screen. And then I'm going to just hide everything else, so all we're left with is this guy's tweets. and go back into view mode, and then zoom out. So what I can now see is we've got a couple of tweets uh, down here, and then we've got another bunch, of, a whole bunch of uh, sequence of tweets across uh, by the actual air show itself. What we then want to do is, is if we actually then want to actually sort of uh, follow it through a little bit more, rather than just sort of trying to spot, make sure we spotted all the tweets, um, is if I go back to press the space bar and then choose the data set, scroll down on that and choose the order by, and I wanted to order these points by the, the created app, so by the time they were created, and generate the network. And there's just a bit of a bug at the moment, so you just need to reselect uh, visible on the top data set, and then we can take that off. And what you should now have is basically the journey of this particular person through the air show. So if I just uh, fly back to here. 
so essentially if we look at these tweets, just clear that, put that down. Just need to make his data points active. The reason why we have this active button is, is that there's quite an extra processing load in terms of making them active. Uh, so we can let you switch that off and leave me. So here we've got the guy arriving, um, whatever it is, Monday morning, uh, 951, uh, at the parking lot, which is why if I click on one of these, you can see, you can zoom back out. You can see the parking lot was basically in the, the woods just on the edge of uh, Farnborough. So we've got him arriving at the location. Um, still saying he's at the parking lot, talking to one of his mates. We can then fly along. The next time we see him reporting in is actually when he's queuing for security and complaining about that. He then moves from there to the main, if I just put the, see what show you where the pin is, so actually into the main display area of the air show. And you can then see he spends a bit of time there, moving around a little bit. That could just be uh, jitter from the GPS. Um, basically going to all the presentations about space. And so that's from 10.54, and that's up until 12.07. So he spends about an hour and a bit there. You then see he then moves to another location on the airfield. And you can see basically that's put him uh, just on the, the edge of the, the, uh, the stand area. And what he's now doing, he's at the Lockheed Martin Chalet, um, looking for the flying displays. Um, you know, he's actually then beginning to post URLs of pictures. Um, and don't advise you doing it, it just takes a while for the web browser to load up. Uh, but we can actually follow that link straight through to the web browser to actually see the post um, and see the photos that he took. So he sees all the, all the flights. Um, and then we see him heading back to the area of the security desk leaving the exercise, and then says what he's been doing for the day. And then the last tweet we get is, sorry, he's had to suddenly disappear, and he's, that's it. Um, but might see you tomorrow or Friday. So that's the end of his first day's activity. So, so how did you get the location data again? That's on Twitter. He has got GPS location uh, enabled on his tweets, so that's how we're doing it. Um, so we can see that was the, the first day's data is basically from this point here to that point there. There's then quite a big gap, which is on to the next day. So we see him appearing just once the next day, back in this case for the third trade day. And then we see him, just, that's the only tweet we've got from him, and then we see him coming back at uh, basically the end of the week. So what we've been able to do is from identifying that sort of interesting cluster of, okay, here's a cluster of activity from somebody. Have we got them elsewhere on the database? Uh, yes, we have. Can we then get the system to actually draw in what their path has been? Um, and away we go. And almost any time we've looked at this sort of Twitter data, we've been able to find these sort of patterns and do this sort of analysis. One of the, ones, one of the first ones we did was we noticed there was like a smear of Twitter over the University of Birmingham campus. And it was one person, and it was a smear because they're actually walking through the campus, and you get some idea of how fast they're going by the vertical separation of the tweets. Um, so we then did a similar thing. We searched on that person's tweets. And we actually saw we had them from the M42 out, oh, sorry, from the M6 outside Wolverhampton, going all the way down the motorway, straight through Birmingham town centre, arriving at the campus, going through the campus for the day, then disappearing out by an alternate route at the end of the day. Um, you could then read, read the tweets to then work out what's going on, particularly how come they were tweeting whilst going so fast down the M6, um, and discovered actually what it was. They were a student coming to an open day at the university, being driven by their brother, and having an argument with the brother about why, why couldn't they go to Cadbury World instead of going to the university. Um, but basically, just from that one smear, you are able to build up that entire story of what that person was doing that day, how they were travelling through the space, what sort of modes of transport, um, and the like. So say, hopefully that's giving you just one example um, of how we can use some of the tools in Datascape uh, to look at this sort of uh, time in geocoded data. Uh, what we're now going to do is going to switch over to Daryl, and then Daryl will then take you through a visualization of some very different sort of data. Ready when you are, Daryl? <laughs> Any questions whilst we're uh, waiting? I don't think once you got that um, network, it'd be much easier to navigate it if it was processing in 2D somehow. Because actually going around all those nodes is a little bit big, a uh, lot of effort. Yeah, you don't, have, you, don't, you don't have to do that. You can actually just click your way through them. So if, I've, if I click the set the data set, um, where is it? Sexual items. 
I can actually get the system to click me through each of those if I want to. So I don't have to manually navigate through it. Um, if you want to see it in 2D at that point, um, then all you do is just choose the vertical bar um, and just say flatten it. And there's the data in 2D. So we, you can, and as I say, you, you can actually change the amount of 3D in this you wanted it. Could you change the color or some other dimension based on the time? Yep. Yep. So you could, okay. Yep. You, so one, one thing we've done sometimes is we've made the uh, basically make the tweets fade away, so the old tweets are showing very pale, and yes. the re most recent tweets are showing very bright. I mean, essentially, you, the way you do that is just on the data, um, just on the data mappings. Then color here, we can do, well, there's, there's a couple of ways of doing it. One is you can use the, the lookup tables um, and a range function to say these ranges assigned oh, right. to these colors. Okay. The other way is you can do it algorithmically because we can put decimal RGB values into that. Oh, okay. So you can actually make one of those based on a time function based on the time difference. Okay. Um, I mean, what we're going to do is basically build up recipes on, on the wiki for this. Because it's, you know, people say, okay, how do I do exactly that? Right. What we can do is we can just show basically a screenshot of that's, that's the settings you need so as to do time fading by color or time back to color. Um, and it's very much what we found in using it is it's about saying, okay, how do I do this? You work out what the mappings are, and it's then there, and it's then that, that you just basically just add into your library. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, yeah. Does, does it handle um, kind of map projections, that kind of thing? Because you're using uh, OpenStreetMap Google Maps. Yeah. One of, one of the things we're actually just doing at the moment is, again, working out what the recipes are we can put into there, so as to do the, the adjustments for the different projections. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's something we know that, at the moment, if you plot over a large area, then you'll get a lot of error coming into because of the differences in projections. So is, are, there, are there sort of more optimum spatial temporal scales that work best for auto analysis? I haven't got that far into it yet to know. Yeah. 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 OK. Right. Thank you, Jerry. Would well, anyone want to move on to the cyber data? Do you want to bring up the. Um, do you want it on here or not? No, great. I'm going to see the top of the screen. No, it's, it's to do with the fact I think they've got two different versions of, of reader on there. That's what it is.
Okay, just start up there, just there. Then create a new workspace. Okay, and then load data unattached. Choose the side data. the <laughs> 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 And then load them attached. Uh, 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 and then just go straight to this is a basic one. Let's continue. Yes. Yes. And then choose the yes. Uh, 
Thousand is the maximum number of points we put on screen at any one time. We find normally we find it with working 10 20, right. I mean, 10 20 thousand. I mean, 10 20 thousand, there's no problem at all. Um, I'm trying to do 65 thousand. I see this. Uh, yeah, but once you get into it, yeah, yeah, it's not a problem. Then you see, then you'll find it. Uh, yeah. okay. What you can also do is you can, uh, if you hold down the alt key, you can lock the view to a particular plane. Right, so, it so it doesn't say, you know, uh, and you can change that to if you want to take the whole lot of and then you can zoom out. So the less frequency, the Yeah, whilst you're inside the data, it's okay. It's uh, okay. Yeah, but this one, once you get outside of it, it's, it's just a bit of a struggle. Thank you. 
Rusty, which is fishing boat, and there's also a Belfast, which is a uh, uh, speedboat, blah, blah, blah. Initially, what we're going to do is just sort of provide a, a basic set of shapes in, in, in the application, um, and then we'll provide libraries of uh, shape based, based on different sorts of markets. So, see, tanks and aircraft, military people, and other things for other people. Um, and then, probably in due course, there'll be the ability to actually upload your own 3D objects. The important thing is to actually keep the objects fairly simple, particularly if you're going to try and spot the you know, about 40,000, 50,000 of them. Uh, they need to be relatively simple objects to keep all the side of Here, I've just uh, remapped colour to the. Uh, to make it so to change, change that sky bit. Yes, it's a bit stuck on. Geographic type example, just to finish off with, uh, do something totally different. So, I mentioned earlier on we've been doing some work with um, some biologists, systems biologists at the University of Warwick, um, and one of the things they gave us was, was this set of data, um, and this is protein interactions um, within a plant cell. And what we've done is uh, coded the um, size of the object is based on the age, so how long has that particular protein been in the cell. Um, so the small points are relatively young, uh, the larger points are uh, the older ones. The lines represent the different um, uh, tests they did to identify the interactions, there's about six different uh, tests and then they're colour coded. Um, and this is what the, the scientists uh, describe as a ridiculum, um, because it just looks like a complete bird's nest. Um, and trying to make any sense of what's going on, uh, not particularly easy. Um, what we've done at this point is we've just pulled the vertical axis, we've mapped the frequency. So basically this uh, protein at the top here um, is the one that's got the highest numbers of connections, uh, the ones at the bottom layer are the ones that have got the lowest numbers of connections. Um, now what we want to do is try and achieve a slightly better uh, layout than that. Um, this is a, to bring in network graphs, we bring them in as two items. We bring in one file that's got the nodes and a second file that's got the linkages. Um, and with the linkages, we've got the same sort of mapping available to us uh, as we do with nodes. Uh, so we can change the color, the size, uh, we can change the size of the end, so we can show directionality. Uh, the line. Um, but what we're going to do is, is run what's called a, a force graph um, on this. Uh, the force graphs at the moment, we've uh, actually running them in, uh, uh, running, running them in two dimensions. So what we're doing is a bit of force graph, we're assuming every node on there, every protein has got a charge, so it's trying to get away from all the others. And then if it's actually got an interaction uh, with another protein, we're assuming there's a spring. And that's, so it's trying to pull together the things that you're interacting, push apart the pieces which are. Um, so if I run, Force graph. And then you see the whole thing begins to just separate itself out a bit. What it begins to do is it begins to push the things that haven't got uh, any interaction with anything else, it pushes those out to the edges. It begins to bring out the clustering a little bit better. And we can actually change dynamically the amount of sort of uh, the relative balance here between the, the springs and the charges as it runs. We can, if we want to, there's a, um, uh, there's an advanced mode, so if you actually know a bit more about what you're doing, you can actually set the, the, the relative strengths and strengths of the charges individually. What we're beginning to get is you can see it's beginning to sort of push out these little small clusters. 
Um, and this is one of the things that the scientists were interested in, was they hadn't realized how many cases they had where they had to put just a group of three uh, going on there. There's another group of three over here. There's another triple. There's another small cluster there. So the fourth graph has begun to pull out, push out uh, those entities which aren't connected to the rest of the network. You can begin to see a little bit better um, some of the sort of subclusters which are going on in the network. But it's still a fairly, fairly dense graph. What we can then do is actually, right here, um, if we then got a particular node we're interested in, uh, we can select that, and then we can start to say, well, okay, show me the connect, show me the connectivity for that particular item. So what we're able to do is start separating out and say, okay, that's the one person I'm interested in in the middle graph. Let's just have a look at their particular connections and see if they've got a bug at the moment. Um, so we can begin to isolate. We can actually build out the order of connectivity we want. So if we want first order, second order, third order connections, uh, we can grow the graph out as far as we go. So, so it's a way of beginning to uh, make a little bit more sense of the whole network than what we start with. What we found, uh, what we did find interesting when we were showing this to um, some of the guys in the police is we went through the description of the, uh, the network um, and the sort of features we were seeing. And the sort of features we were seeing in the network were identical to what they find in gangs. So you were finding situations where you might have um, you know, something like a, a, a young, uh, young Turk who's come in, set up his own gang, totally separate from what's already there. Uh, you know, in a situation where you've got somebody slightly older who's got a, net, uh, a network running through some older people within the organisation. Um, and you have, again, cases of people who are right at the edge of the organisation. Uh, you also have situations where you've got linkages between the main clusters. So the same sort of social graph analysis that you might apply uh, within an Intel scenario actually apply just as, as easily to the protein side. Um, so we're developing this, this side of it a bit more so as to make it easier to take the social graph and actually get it to a form where you can read really sensibly uh, and then also the information within. So I uh, hopefully that's given you an idea about sort of what Datascape is doing. As I say, this is still the beta version, um, but we're aiming for a release um, with the final version in a few weeks. Um, it's going to be available on the website. There's going to be two versions of it. One version is a community edition, uh, which is free for individual use, uh, so there's no charge for that. Um, and then there'll be a commercial version uh, that's available for organisations. Uh, the free version will have a limitation of probably two to five thousand data points in it, uh, whereas the, the pro version will take up to six to five thousand. Um, and there'll be a full sort of suite of supporting services that run alongside that. Certainly, if anybody wants a lot of further demonstration and with particular sorts of data, uh, then we're more than happy to sort of arrange that. And we'll be running webinars and on the website. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we're also publishing a day white paper at the same time that gives some of the, the technical background. So hopefully that's given you a feel for what Datascape is capable of, some idea of the very different ways in which we can represent data uh, within 3D space, some of the challenges with things like navigating around it, um, and some of the, the things that we need to look at so as to make that as easy as possible. Um, but certainly we're finding, if we're showing this to different organisations, they can see how, for particular sorts of information, for particular sorts of inquiry, uh, this gives them a very valuable additional way of looking at that information. Are there any final questions? If not, thanks very much for your attention. Thanks for writing as guinea pigs and putting it through the paces. But uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks. Thanks.